Good afternoon, everybody. Today I want to begin to talk about some of the basics of uh, infection. And so far in this course, we have um, talked about experiments done in cell culture. We've talked about the replication cycle mainly, but of course if viruses just infected cell cultures in our lab, they wouldn't do very well. They wouldn't persist in a population, right? They need to get into a host. Cell cultures are nothing more than experimental systems that we use to study them. So we're going to switch now to talk about virus infections in a host and all the things that happen there. So remember, everybody, every host that, or potential host for a virus has a great immune system. It's got both specific and nonspecific immune defenses that we've mentioned briefly and we'll mention a little bit more later. And these immune systems have evolved to deal with infections, including of viruses that we'll talk about, but also other things, bacterial, fungal infections, parasitic infections, tumors. Uh, and they are really good. Our immune system is terrific. In a healthy person, there's nothing like it. So if, unless the parasites evolve to get around it in some way, they would, they would be gone. So every virus that, that's around right now has successfully evaded that. And that will be something we talk about a bit in this course as well. This is a very interesting interface where the virus meets the host. It's like a battle. I hate to use warfare characterizations, but it's a battle because evolution regulates what happens. The virus evolves to evade the host. The host evolves and the virus evolves. And you can see traces of this evolution in the sequences of viral and, and host proteins. A really interesting area of virology. And in the first lecture, I told you we live and prosper in a cloud of viruses. And this is still true because most infections have no consequence. They don't do anything. We are kind of biased by the infections that cause serious disease, but really most of them don't do anything. Uh, most particles don't land on the right cell. I mean, if you're sitting here and viruses are landing on your skin, the outer layer of your skin is dead, right? So virus can't do anything in those cells. Many of them get inactivated. Many of them end after one or two infections of cells. But even if we do get infected, most of the time these infections are what we call inapparent. They don't cause any symptoms. We do have an immune response when we get these infections and we, that's how we can tell that there are so many inapparent infections because we do serological surveys and we see that there are antibodies to a virus in a population that has never been sick, that has never had the disease caused by that virus. So uh, viruses do replicate during these inapparent infections and we can transmit them. So that's how these viruses persist. They go from one person to another. You don't know you're shedding virus because you're not sick and the virus is, is succeeding. This is, I think, the ultimate virus, one that's passed without killing its host, without even making its host think that there is any infection going on. And I think the ones that cause overt disease, and we'll focus a lot on these, are really the exception. So here's an example. This is West Nile virus. Uh, this is a flavivirus. It is an RNA, a plus-stranded RNA virus. It has an icosahedral capsid. Uh, and on, around the icosahedral capsid is a membrane envelope with lipid glycoproteins, with viral glycoproteins in it. So now you see why we did the first part of this course. When I talk about the viruses that cause disease, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you hadn't had any of the material we discussed, you would have no clue what T equals 4, what is T equals 3, what is he talking about? So now you know. And that's why it's important to, to take the first uh, 11 lectures. So West Nile is spread uh, by mosquitoes. Before 1999, didn't exist in the US, as far as we knew. It, originally, it originated in Uganda and was present in, in various parts of the world over there, but not, had never come to the US. Came to the US in 1999, actually came to Queens. Came over probably on an airplane from Israel uh, and uh, started off in Queens. It was a hot summer, spread really, really well. Uh, by October 24, about a million people had been infected already. And we know this because we did serological surveys. 
about 20% of these people had a febrile illness. That means some kind of a virus-induced <coughs> illness. You couldn't tell what virus it is. Many viruses, we say, cause febrile illness. It's, it's accompanied by fever and any number of other symptoms. And about 1% of the people develop neuroinvasive illness. That is, the virus got into the CNS. So you see 80% of the infections were inapparent. We had no idea that they were going on, no obvious disease. And this is important, right, because if these people give blood, this is a virus that spreads in your blood. If you have West Nile infection and you give blood, unless they check the blood for the virus, you're going to spread it to other people. And about 20% of them could get sick. And 1% could have neuroinvasive illness, which is not good. You end up having problems. So as soon as we knew that West Nile was in the US, we had to start checking the blood. And today, the blood supply is checked for dozens of different kinds of viruses. This is a problem because uh, if you have an epidemic of a disease, maybe you don't see it early enough because there's a lot of inapparent infections. And so by the time you see, oh, this is West Nile, then it's kind of late to stop things. So that's why inapparent infections um, are a problem. We'll come back to more of that later on. Now, when did we start to look at microbes as infectious agents? We talked a little bit about this in the first uh, lecture, but for most of the time that humans have been around, we thought that diseases were caused by poisonous air, also known as miasmas. So we really were not very savvy. We didn't believe in science, and science, in fact, was not very good until uh, the 1800s or so when we learned from Robert Koch and others that microorganisms uh, could cause disease. And he worked with bacteria, of course. There were no viruses yet when he was working. Uh, and he developed what are called Koch's postulates, which are criteria for identifying that an agent causes disease. And these have been used up until today. In a way, we have been bound by his postulates because Koch viewed every microbe as a disease-causing entity. And this is clearly not the case. Most of the microbes on the planet are actually very good. So we have to get around this, this sort of bias that Koch uh, gave us. First human virus, yellow fever virus in 1901. Uh, this was identified by uh, Walter Reed together with uh, Carlos Finlay and Jesse Lazier. In, and this is a painting of a, an experiment they did in, in Havana where they are infecting a soldier with a mosquito that's trapped in that uh, test tube. Turn the test tube over on the soldier's arm here and the mosquito's gonna bite him and he'll get yellow fever and that's part of the experiments that they did to show that this caused disease. A lot of these individuals died because yellow fever has a certain lethality associated with it. And this is the kind of experiment you could do back then. You can't do these anymore. Very few experiments. You can infect people with some viruses uh, and we'll talk a little bit about those, but generally they don't kill you as yellow fever does. Since that day, since 1901, we have been interested in how viruses cause disease. We want to know how they work because we want to prevent them uh, and somehow make vaccines and antivirals and do other maybe ways of treating sick people. So that's been the driving force for this field called viral pathogenesis, which is really to understand how viruses uh, cause disease. And these are some of the questions that we study and some of the questions we'll get at in this course. How does a virus get in you? How do, what's the initial host response? Where did the virus replicate? How does it spread? What are the sites of replication? What organs and tissues? Uh, does the infection get cleared after a short period of time? Is it an acute infection? Or does it remain persistent and stay with you for many, many years? And of course, how do you transmit it to other people? These are all things we didn't touch on at all in the first 11 lectures in this course, that, because this has to do with infections of hosts. So to start an infection in a person, any kind of host other than a cell culture, you have three requirements. You need enough virus particles, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Wherever the virus comes, the cells have to be accessible, susceptible, and permissive. So now you know why I wanted you to know what susceptible and permissive mean, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't know what this meant. And finally, the antiviral defense systems either have to be absent, so you have to have an immune problem of some sort, or maybe the infection is happening, happening where there isn't a good immune response. We have some areas like that in our body. 
Or maybe the virus is antagonizing it. And maybe that's how a lot of viruses get their hold on. They antagonize the immune defenses. Because as I told you, they are pretty good, these immune defenses. How many virions does it take to infect the host? I want to get rid of this feedback. I don't like that, and I'm sure you don't. Uh, how many virions? Well, it really depends. It varies for every... You'll hear about some viruses where it's very inefficient to infect. HIV is a really poor infector. All right? It takes uh, many, many coital events to be infected with HIV, up to 1,000. So it's a 1 in 1,000 chance. And it, so the higher the virus load in a person, the more likely that you're going to transmit HIV. On the other hand, noroviruses, these cruise ship viruses that cause gastroenteritis, probably 10 particles are enough for you to ingest and cause disease. So it really depends on the virus, depends on the host. Here are some of the factors that control how many viruses it takes to uh, start an infection. It's genetics of the population, defenses, viral virulence plays into account, host social behavior, how the virus is transmitted, for example, the age of the host, the weather, the environment, and probably many other things as well. So it's an important determinant, and we have general ideas for some viruses versus the other. We have many nonspecific defenses that initially prevent virus infection, and the, the, the environment is also very hostile as well. I mean, remember, viruses are quite small particles floating around or in fluids, and they're easily inactivated. So, for example, heat drying sunlight, which has UV, all of these will inactivate virus infectivity. But viruses get around all these things. Just as you'll see later, they get around uh, immune defenses. They get around these things as well. They make a lot of virus particles. That's a strategy for overcoming drying and low pH and UV inactivation. Um, many viruses uh, are stable to low pH or proteases. So your gut has low pH and it has proteases, uh, but their viruses have evolved to survive the passage in the gut. Not all of them, of course, but some have. And these are transmitted by fecal-oral routes. Um, and some viruses say, forget it, I'm not going out there, it's too, too nasty, it's a, it's a bad world. So they stay within their hosts. So they, they propagate in the mosquito, and then the mosquito bites you and puts the virus right in you. And then another mosquito will pick up the virus from you or it ends in you. So this virus says, I can't deal with low pH or, or UV rays and I'm going to stay in my host. So the vectors, uh, life cycles of these viruses involve insect vectors. And then other viruses are spread by contact. Forget the respiratory spread. I'm going to transfer by body fluids uh, in, and require direct contact. So Ebola virus infections, typically you have to have direct contact with an infected person or um, encounter a lot of body fluids. So if you're a physician intubating a patient with Ebola and the, and the patient uh, expels large quantities of infected fluids on you, then you can get infected. So lots of ways to get around uh, these issues. So we're going to talk a lot about viral pathogenesis. Again, that's how, how a pathogen makes disease. And I want you to remember that there are two components to this. It's not just the virus, okay? Most people think the virus does everything. But in fact, it's both the virus, the viral replication, obviously that, that's part of it. But it's what we do in response often is the problem. In fact, for many diseases, all the symptoms, viral diseases, all the symptoms are your immune response to the virus infection. If you didn't have that immune response, you'd probably be well. Of course, the virus would replicate uh, uncontrolled, but uh, in fact, this is a huge component. And in some infections, it's everything. And there are some animal models where you can show that. If you take away the immune response, there's no disease. All right, so remember that. Two components of every viral infection, what the virus does and what we do in return. And also, uh, virus infections aren't always bad. Sometimes they do nothing. They're benign. They're inapparent, or they can be lethal. They can be quick. And these are acute infections that are over in a few days or a week or two. Uh, or they can go on for years. Like HIV can go on for 10 to 15 years. So there's a huge range. There's a huge spectrum of what can happen after a virus infection. So let's talk about how viruses get in us. We're pretty well protected. Um, we have this, this largest organ in our body, our skin, 
uh, covering our body, and that's, as I said, well, the outer layer is dead cells. Um, so that's pretty good, but you know, we can get mosquito bites of various sorts. We can have animals bite us and deliver viruses. We can get viruses by scratch or injury. So the skin isn't perfect. It's pretty good for just everyday life, but can be breached. But there are uh, other places where viruses can get in. And these are mostly mucosal membranes. We have to have uh, surfaces that are permeable that can exchange material with the environment and those are where the viruses have evolved to infect us and they're, they're shown here and we're going to go over uh, some of these. We'll start with the skin which is a great barrier to infection as I said. The epidermis, the outer layer uh, is composed of many many layers of different sorts but the very outer layer of course is dead and when a virus lands on the dead cell it's not going to get in them it's not going to replicate because they are dead. And as you know, viruses require living cells in which to replicate. In fact, beyond the fact that the outer layer is dead, uh, the skin has a relatively low pH. And um, it's often, it often contains antimicrobial peptides of various sorts that are made by our cells and our commensal bacteria. Our ba we have bacteria living on our skin. You know, you can wash them off, but they come back and they produce antimicrobial peptides that benefit you. They protect you from other uh, organisms that come in. So the skin is well protected, but beneath it, of course, there are living cells, and, even, and beneath the epidermis, of course, you have blood vessels and lymph vessels, which if a virus could get in here, that could take them somewhere else, and that often happens. The mucosal surfaces are good places to infect, as I said. They are aligned by living cells, the respiratory tract, the alimentary tract, uh, and these are, of course, have, have barriers that are exposed to the environment. So we have to protect them. I mean, we need the respiratory mucosa, right? We have to be able to take in oxygen and get rid of CO2 and other things. Same with the gut. We need to take in nutrients and so forth. So there's no choice. We can't seal them over with concrete. So we have to protect them in other ways. We have some pretty good defenses as you will see in these areas. So let's start with the respiratory tract, which is probably the most common way for us to pull in a virus because we're constantly breathing in, right? Six liters per minute is the average um, volume of air that you take in. So just think you're sampling wherever you walk, you are sampling the air. And as I said, that is full of viruses, especially if someone has just coughed or sneezed. But in any case, there are always viruses there. Uh, the respiratory tra tract is shown here. Of course, there's the upper tract and the lower tract joined by the trachea, and viruses can replicate anywhere in this tract. It is lined by an epithelial layer shown here on the left. And um, this is, these are typical ciliated brush border cells. They have a coating of mucus on top of them. That's a barrier to infection. Mucus has many inhibitors to infection, and that's made by specific cells. Uh, these, these cells are ciliated and they tend, if these cells are lower down in the lung and some particle gets in or some virus gets trapped in the mucus and there's this elevator that brings the mucus up into your mouth and then you swallow it as I said yesterday. There's also uh, ciliary, ciliary activity that would bring a virus that gets in your mouth back to the, to the back of your throat where you would also swallow it. So that's quite important. And viruses, as I said, can infect any, any level of the um, respiratory tract. And when they do, and you can see there's a list of viruses on the right here that infect different parts. When they do, you get what's called clinical syndromes. So the virus infects, you get inflammation. And that inflammation has these itis names after them, like rhinitis or pharyngitis or laryngitis, depending on where the virus is replicating. Tracheitis, bronchitis, bronchiolitis, and finally uh, bronco pneumonia. So viruses, again, can multiply in this layer. They can remain in the upper tract. They can spread to the middle or the lower tract, depending on many different factors. So as I said, um, the, the respiratory tract has pretty good defenses. We have this mucus. You make 20 to 200 uh, milliliters of mucus per day in your nasal cavity and lungs. It's a lot of volume of mucus, and that's what helps to sweep away material that gets in there, either in your mouth or from your lungs to the esophagus. It's a pretty good escalator, a centimeter a minute. Uh, 
So that filters out particles. In addition, in our lower tract, we have immune cells. We have macrophages, alveolar macrophages, whose job it is to patrol. Uh, there are also antibodies there as well. So it's pretty well protected. Alimentary tract is the next place where viruses like to get in. This, of course, is, is ideal because we're eating. We're always putting things in our mouth and swallowing them, and viruses find a way to do that. They have to pass through the stomach and be resistant to that, but many have evolved to do so. And the, the, the GI tract, of course, is always moving. As soon as you eat food, your stomach is moving it around to digest it. Then it goes into your intestines, and it's moving some more. So lots of opportunities for viruses to contact the wall, which they have to do. This is where the cells are to, to infect. So here's a, uh, a diagram of the intestinal tract. This is the small intestine. And this, of course, uh, is, a, is a barrier, a permeability barrier. It has to take up certain things from your gut lumen and put other things out. So it has direct contact with uh, the exterior through the, the upper tract, of course, and viruses can get in there. Again, it also consists of a layer of epithelium called enterocytes in this case. You can see the typical villi here uh, composed of uh, the enterocytes interspersed with these so-called M cells. And the M cells sample the gut lumen for foreign antigens. That's their job. So they are quite uh, endocytic. They're always taking up material in the lumen and passing it to immune cells below. So that's one way that viruses can get in by this natural capture mechanism. Now you see uh, below this, this epithelium is what I've labeled basement membrane. This was also present in the respiratory epithelium. It's not really a membrane, but it's a macromolecular structure, which is quite impermeable and prevents things from simply going from uh, the lumen to the underlying tissues. And of course, the underlying tissues would have the blood vessels and the lymph uh, capillaries that, could, uh, that viruses could have access to. When, when infections occur, the com the, this membrane is compromised. Inflammation that accompanies infection, that is production of cytokines, recruitment of immune cells, that is inflammation, and this tends to loosen up this barrier, and that's one way that, that viruses get across. So again, the inflammation is a host response to infection to try and clear it, and what it's doing is loosening up the basement membrane so that viruses can get in. Your genital tract is also a portal of entry. This is protected by low pH and mucus, but again, abrasions can let viruses in, so HIV gets in this way but human papillomaviruses can get in naturally and infect these, these cells as well. In some cases, the, re, the infections remain localized, so the HPVs remain localized and may cause warts and eventually possibly uh, cervical cancers. Uh, HIV can spread elsewhere, as we will see. The eye is another portal, right? You have this wonderful optical instrument, but it has cells exposed to the environment, so you're Eye proper is covered with a cell layer called the conjunctiva. You see it right there. It covers the cornea, and that is a layer of epithelial cells, and that can be infected with various viruses. Now, you're blinking often, and the blinking washes the conjunctiva, and that's one way of getting rid of most particles or viruses, but occasionally they infect. If you get some grit in your eye and you rub it, that makes a little scratch in the epithelium, and then that lets viruses in. If you swim in a hot tub that's not properly sanitized and there's a lot of virus in it, a good target for that is the eye. And these infections, we call them conjunctivitis because the viruses are infecting the conjunctival membrane. Uh, they're often accompanied by this subconjunctival uh, sub bleed. Uh, there is bleeding underneath the conjunctival membrane, so you get this very a striking red pattern, which goes away eventually, but looks quite scary. And there are quite a few viruses uh, that can do that. And some viruses aren't restricted to the conjunctival membranes. They can actually spread to the back of the eye and get into the optic nerve and eventually make it into the CNS. So that's, that is problematic, obviously. Okay, so those are the main ways viruses get into us. And here's a summary of that. Um, which shows you how the viruses are getting in here on the left in the different areas that we just talked about and some of the examples of the viruses that uh, do that. You can see respiratory tract, alimentary, urogenital, eyes, and skin. Now, there's, there are two general patterns that are also listed on here. There are localized infections and there are disseminated infections. So at each of these sites, 
The virus can re remain restricted, so typically rhinoviruses, for example, remain restricted to the respiratory tract. But others that get in by the respiratory route, such as measles, um, here's measles right here, you, you inhale the virus, it replicates in your respiratory tract, but then it gets into your blood and spreads elsewhere and it causes a rash, which kids all used to get when, when I was a kid because we didn't have a vaccine. Uh, now it's totally vaccine preventable, but the point is the virus gets in the lung and spreads elsewhere. So that's what I mean by localized versus systemic. That means the virus can go throughout the rest of your body. And you can see for each of these portals of entry, we have examples of localized infections versus uh, systemic infections. Now in order for viruses to spread beyond their first site of infection, things have to happen that compromise the barrier. So let's say this is the respiratory tract and we have a uh, rhinovirus infecting these cells. The virus replicates in a cell, the cell produces viruses, those viruses spread to neighboring cells, but the spread is restricted by the architecture and by the mucus layer, and the virus does not get below this basement membrane. So many viruses are restricted by that. So apparently rhino doesn't cause the right inflammation to compromise this. But some get beyond this, They're, and that's what we call disseminated infections. And when uh, the virus can infect a lot of different organs, we call that systemic infection. And that, to do that, you have to get past this basement membrane and get into the underlying tissues. And one of the ways to do that is by inflammation. Uh, there are also immune cells that patrol these regions, and uh, they can squeeze through uh, this basement membrane as well. So here's an example of that in the gut. This is again the gut epithelium, and uh, you know we can ha we have an M cell here which is sampling the lumen again, looking for foreign antigens for something that's not right to signal some danger. And uh, here you can see immune cells which are in close proximity to this M cell. These are lymphocytes, and here's a, a macrophage. So these can easily pass uh, through the basement membrane. So a lot of viruses come in an M cell because they're portals for them to do that. And again, once the virus gets beyond the basement membrane, whether it does so in this manner or by inflammation underneath, then you have a free ride anywhere. You've got lymph capillaries and you have um, blood vessels. Now remember, uh, cell sheets are polarized. It's not like cells in a culture dish in the lab, but here in us, in our respiratory epithelium or in our gut, the cells have a very distinct apical domain and a, a very distinct basal lateral domain, distinct in terms of the kinds of proteins that are present in each one. And in fact, viruses selectively get released at either the top or the bottom of cells or both. So for example, here is a picture, this is an electron micrograph of uh, a sheet of epithelial cells. You can grow cells in culture so that they are polarized, that is they have a distinct apical and basal lateral domain. And you can infect them with viruses and see where they're released. So you can see here is influenza virus, which is released by budding. And it only comes off the apical side of cells, never released from below. Same thing uh, with measles virus. But look, vesicular stomatitis virus is released from the bottom, right near the basement membrane, which would be right down here. So you can see that uh, depending on where the virus is released, that could be one determinant of whether the virus infection spreads from that first site or not. And to illustrate that, I, I'm giving you an example from the paramyxoviruses. These are envelope negative strand RNA viruses, and one in particular from Sendai, isolated originally in Sendai, Japan, called Sendai virus. Uh, in, um, normally this virus is released apically, very much like influenza virus. And if you infect mice with this virus, it causes a respiratory infection, which is restricted to the tract, right? You can make a mutant of this virus, where you have a change, a single amino acid change in, in one of the viral proteins, which now allows it to be released from both the top and the bottom of cells, from the apical and the basal lateral domains. And when you infect mice with this virus, it now causes a disseminated infection. It spreads from the tract, it gets through the basement membrane, it gets in the blood and it goes to all organs. And this is a highly lethal infection in mice. So it just shows one thing you've changed. The place where this virus buds, the bottom 
of the cell makes a big difference for pathogenesis. But that's not the only thing. There are many other determinants. For this virus, it happens to be very important, but there are always uh, other issues as well. So when, here's again our epithelial sheet. And if we have infected it with a virus that has the capacity to spread, it will find a way to get beyond the basement membrane, either by inflammation or by taking a ride in an immune cell or using the portals that immune cells use. And then it's in the subepithelial tissues uh, where it can get a ride elsewhere. In, in the subepithelial tissues, there are typically uh, lymphatic capillaries. These are capillaries of the lymph system, which eventually pass through lymph nodes and, and of course, join up with the blood. And the lymph system, of course, is important for sampling what is going on in the tissues. And if there is a virus infection, they will eventually be brought to the lymph node to instruct the immune system. But our virus can get into lymph capillaries. They're quite permeable uh, and go through the lymph nodes to the blood. And there it's, it sets up a, a, what we call a viremia. The virus can spread anywhere in the blood. It can obviously get to all tissues. Some viruses can get directly into uh, circulatory capillaries as well. So they're not shown on here, but that's another route of entry. So now we have virus uh, in the blood, and it can go anywhere. And this is called viremia, virus in the blood. <clears throat> and this is an experiment where an animal has been infected with virus. And this is a virus that's known to replicate in the animal. <coughs> and uh, here we've got on the y-axis the relative virus titer, and then on the x-axis is simply days after infection. So we infect our animal, and then at different days we take some, a little bit of the animal's blood and we measure virus in it. And you can do this by a plaque assay or any other means. So what you see here is as soon as you inoculate virus into the animal, you have a burst of virus in the blood, and then it goes away uh, in a day or so. And this is basically the inoculum that you put in. Maybe you've done a, a tail inoculation, so you're putting virus right in the blood. That's passive viremia because it's a viremia caused by inoculation. Uh, and then if this host is susceptible to infection, you can, it can the virus can replicate and cause what we call a primary viremia. That is, now we have actively replicating virus, uh, and that virus is spilling over into the blood, and you get a burst of virus primary viremia, because that's the first one that happens after inoculation. This may go down then, the titer virus may go down in the blood, and then it may go up in a big way to give you this secondary viremia. So what's happening here, the virus you put in is growing at some sites. You get a little burst of virus in the blood, but then that brings it to other organs where the virus can multiply some more and it's amplified, and that's why you get this big burst of secondary viremia. So that's what the terms mean, passive, primary, and secondary. So viremia is a big deal, right? Because not only can it spread virus to different organs within you, but it's a problem with the blood supply. So we're stuck with using blood from donors. We don't know how to make synthetic blood yet. I don't know, I don't know when we're going to do that, but it's not easy. So we have to have people give blood. You, you don't think so, Dr. Silverstein, ever? It's on its way. It's on its way? You have shares in that company? No. Um, this is really a problem because as I said, people can have inapparent infections and then you spread them from the blood supply. The, the history of AIDS is full of people, especially hemophiliacs, who require uh, routine uh, supplementing of their blood to get infected by, uh, by these viruses before we knew they were there. So as I said, we have to check the blood supply for all these viruses. It would be nice not to have to do that. So here's an example of an infection which illustrates these parts, primary infection, spread, secondary viremia. This happens to be a classic done by Frank Fenner in mice with a virus called mousepox. And this applies to many other human infections as well. So in this uh, example, what we do is we inoculate mice in the foot pad uh, with virus. So that's a foot pad right there. And then uh, the virus multiplies in the, in the epithelium in the foot pad. And that's right here, all these little particles. It invades the skin, gets through a lymph node, and then gets into the blood. So that's your primary viremia. So virus multiplying at the skin and going through the lymph system to the blood. So if you are doing a, a, a graph of this infection like the one I just showed you, you get that primary viremia. The viremia then allows virus to go to other places, spleen, liver, multiplies in those. Eventually it causes disease, necrosis, killing of the tissue. 
uh, and that makes even more virus present, and that's the secondary viremia, and that allows virus to get back to the skin, and you end up getting this rash on the mice. So this is early and later stages of the rash. And as this is happening, you also get a swelling in the foot. That's the disease by having virus replicating there. So it's an example of virus getting in at a certain place and spreading elsewhere. You put it in the foot pad and it eventually makes rash on the skin. And this is sort of what measles does, but in a different way. We, we acquire measles by inhalation, replicates in our lung, gets into the blood, and goes to other organs and eventually makes it to our skin where it causes uh, the rash. So many viruses spread in the blood. This is a summary of some of those pathways. So uh, you have an infection, you initiate by infection. This can be in the lung, it can be in the uh, respiratory, the uh, uh, alimentary tract, it could be urogenital tract. Virus gets past the epithelial barrier through the lymph system into the blood where it can then replicate uh, in other sites. Gives, that's your primary viremia. And then these replication at these other tissues, whatever they may be, depends on the virus, gives you your secondary viremia. And that may further spread the virus to different targets. And these are just some of the target tissues for a variety of viruses that spread this way. Poliovirus, for example, targeting the brain, uh, arenaviruses and hantas in the lung, and uh, some viruses in the skin, including the mousepox virus that, that we just talked about. So spread via the blood seeds uh, virus to many tissues where it can cause the symptoms of an infection. And a rash is one of the things that viruses cause. These are some viruses that cause rashes, including uh, measles virus. And these are two different kinds of rashes, maculopapular or vesicular rashes. So a maculopapular rash is shown on the left here. It's a reddish, flat-looking rash, which sometimes can have uh, breaks of the skin in the center, and a vesicular rash is, as the word said, these are vesicles full of fluid, and again, in both cases, you have virus present and interacting with the immune system to cause this rash. So again, these are, for example, measles you inhale, it replicates in your lung and eventually spreads to your skin by this pathway that we've been talking about. So viruses spread readily in the blood, quite clearly, but they can also spread in your nerves and it's called neural spread. And typically, the viruses will infect nerve endings. These can be sensory endings or motor endings, right? So sensory nerves, right, innervate various parts of you to sense various things, including pain. Viruses can get in there, or they can get in at the motor end plate, and these are nerves that innervate your muscles, of course, and allow them to move. And then the viruses can spread uh, into the CNS, through the nerves themselves, through the axons themselves, and eventually get into the, the primary cell body, the motor neuron, or, or whatever the neuron might be uh, in the CNS. And some viruses do this all the time. So this is what rabies likes to do. When you get bitten by a rabid animal, say you're bitten on the hand by a rabid dog, the virus makes its way to the uh, nerve endings in your muscle. It enters those and then spreads slowly to the central nervous system in the nerves by transport pathways. This takes a long time to happen and that's why you can be vaccinated against rabies and still be protected. By the time the virus gets to the CNS, you'll be protected because it takes so long to get there. Uh, other viruses get into the CNS accidentally, like polio infects your gut and 99 out of 100 infections, the, the, the infection remains there or else gets into the blood and you have a transient viremia. But in one out of 100, for some reason that we do not understand, the virus gets into the CNS. We think it gets there uh, from the muscle to the motor end plate and going to the CNS by axonal transport. So that's neural spread. Viruses spread in nerves in very specific ways. This is a, an amplification of what I've been telling you. They can spread in a retrograde direction, that is from the termini to the uh, primary motor neuron. And so for example, in this case, let's say this is a, um, a muscle and this nerve is innervating it, the virus enters the nerve endings. It's transported within the axon by, by transport pathways. Remember all those motor proteins that bring things to the cell body, 
the virus needs to get there. A virus can't replicate anywhere else. It's not all the, all the things a virus need are not present in the axon. They're only present in the cell body. So the virus needs to get there. It can replicate in the cell body and then cross to the next uh, set of nerves by transsynaptic spread. It's liberated from the neuron and then gets into the next uh, nerve terminus to keep going. So it can move and move and move just like that. And it can do it in an anterograde fashion as well. The virus can start, say, in the brain in a primary neuron and then leave the brain by this sort of movement accompanied by transsynaptic spread. And I showed you this picture way in the beginning of a virus, a herpes virus, labeled with green fluorescent protein. And this virus was injected at a very specific part. Let's say it was injected up here, and it entered this neuron, and that is spreading through all these neuronal circuits. You see there's an axon and cell body in each of these, and they're synapsing. And the virus has spread from the inoculation site all the way down here. That's an example of axonal spread. And you can use this to map circuits in the brain. You do this, of course, in experimental animals. And you can say, if I put virus in a very specific place, in the brain, where does it go? And you can map all the wiring that way. It's very cool. There are links to your CNS in your nasal cavity. Your smell depends on this. So you have olfactory receptors in the top of your nasal cavity here. And those nerves, which are shown here, <coughs> go right through the bone. It's the, the place where they go through is called the cribiform plate. It has passages for um, these uh, receptor cell bodies, these olfactory rods, if you will, to go in and, and synapse with uh, uh, neurons in the olfactory bulb. That's how you sense smells. The smells are sensed down here, and then the impulses are passed up into the CNS. And this is a good portal of entry for viruses in principle anyway. Fortunately, it doesn't happen that much. Um, but um, it's one way that viruses can get in right from your nasal cavity into the CNS. Now, when you get an infection of the CNS, certain things uh, can happen, and we have various words to describe them. Uh, we use the term neurotropic virus, and that signifies a virus that can infect neural cells. Doesn't matter how the virus gets into the CNS, the ability to infect, say, to replicate in a nerve cell means that it's neurotropic. Neuroinvasive means that simply the virus can get into the CNS. That's all it means, that you put a virus like rabies uh, in your hand, it can get into your CNS. That means it's neuroinvasive. Neurovirulence means the virus can cause disease. And that is not implied by any of these previous two terms. Being neurotropic or neuroinvasive is not enough to be neurovirulent. You have to actually be able to cause disease. So we know many viruses that can infect your CNS, your brain, but they don't cause disease. They are not neurovirulent. So here's some examples. Herpes simplex virus has low neuroinvasiveness. It doesn't go into your brain very often, but when it does, it is quite neurovirulent. Uh, mumps virus, on the other hand, which used to be a common childhood infection before the mumps vaccine was used, is highly neuroinvasive. It turns out that half of kids who got mumps, and mumps is a a disease characterized by infection of the salivary glands, so you have a swollen face-looking appearance in these kids. Half of those kids had virus in the brain, and they, we, we couldn't tell. There was no neurovirulence. The virus was innocuous in the brain. So this virus has low neurovirulence, but high neuroinvasiveness. And finally, rabies has the worst combination. It's highly neuroinvasive and highly neurovirulent. So if you get bitten by a rabid animal, you have to have vaccine, otherwise you will die unless you were the one girl in Wisconsin who had the Wisconsin protocol. They put her in a coma, they chilled her, and she lived. But it's not something that, that can be done for everyone. So uh, this is a really bad one. This, in my view, is the most lethal virus, rabies virus. It's not Ebola. It's not avian H5N1 influenza virus. It's rabies virus. All right, so I've told you viruses spread in the blood. They can spread in nerves, but how do they actually get into the tissues where they're going to replicate, right? That's really the key, and this is how they do that. And tissues have different sorts of structures which may or may not be barriers to virus infection. And here are the three of them here. So in one case you have, this is a capillary. This happens to be in the CNS, 
And you know, capillaries are formed by endothelial cells. There's the nucleus of the cell, and they form a tight junction at one end. So this is basically a cell wrapped around. And the junction is very tight, plus there is this basement membrane around it. So this is very difficult to cross. And these are found in various tissues where it's hard to get from the capillary lumen into the surrounding tissue. Other tissues are a little more forgiving. For example, this one found in these tissues, glomerulus, pancreas, ilium, et cetera. Uh, the uh, endothelial cells have spaces in, at their ends. They have pores where things can get through. They still have a basement membrane, but this is a start. And then finally, uh, some tissues are very liberal at what they let in. And that's partly because they have to let things in very readily. And th there's really uh, not much of a barrier. There's basically a, a lumen formed by uh, endothelial cells, and, and it's very easy to get in and out of them. And the liver is, is, has this sort of setup. So you can see viruses can readily get into these tissues, but it's harder to get into the other two. And in fact, if you inoculate animals with viruses in the blood, the first place they go is, is to the liver. Not all of them will replicate there, but this is very easy to get through. <clears throat> Here's an example of liver being infected. It's, a, uh, it's one of these, it's almost a sinusoid. It's not really a capillary because it's not a closed space. It's just a, 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 an area formed by the endothelial cells, and that's shown right here. So these are hepatocytes on either side, and you see they're loosely covered by cells. In this case, they are actually uh, the liver-specific <laughs> macrophage, the cup for cell, and we have hepatitis B virus passing through here. And many viruses are taken up and passed into the liver, but few can replicate there, and Hep B is one of them, as you can tell by the name. It passes right through the Kupfer cells and goes into the underlying hepatocytes. So this is very easy to get through. Uh, the brain is, is tougher. The brain has these very tightly, fenis, uh, tightly um, closed capillaries, which I showed you before. This is just another example. You can see here the endothelial cells making up the wall of the capillary and the basement membrane, but there are ways to get through here. Uh, viruses have evolved ways and they take advantage of cellular systems. So um, immune cells have to be able to get through the tightest capillaries, no matter where they are. They have to be able to get into the tissues to see what's going on. That's a process called diapodesis. So they can squeeze through. This lymphocyte can go right through. So if it's infected, which it's shown in this, this picture by these purple dots with a virus, the virus will take a ride in the lymphocyte. Some viruses can actually replicate in the endothelial cells. So if you happen to be able to bind a receptor in the endothelium and replicate there, you will cause inflammation that will loosen up the basement membrane, and then you can get into the uh, tissue. And these cells also carry out a process called transcytosis. They take the endothelial cells take up material from the lumen, and they put it in a vesicle, and then the vesicle moves to the other side of the cell and, and deposits that by fusion on the other side, and viruses can take a ride in transcytosis vesicles as well. So this allows a number of viruses to get into the brain, which is shown here. Now the brain is a pretty, uh, it it's, doesn't have a great immune system for various reasons because the cells aren't regenerable, but uh, it has instead a very good barrier against infection. It has these capillaries that are very tight, but there are ways that viruses get in. As I showed you, capillaries throughout the brain proper, what we call the brain parenchyma, uh, viruses can get from them into the brain. Uh, they can get it from meningeal blood vessels or from capillaries in the cerebrum proper. Uh, they can be brought in by nerves, as we showed, by neuronal transport as well. So that's one way, another way viruses can get in. And a number of viruses uh, get in through the choroid plexus. This is a structure in the center of the brain uh, which produces the cerebrospinal fluid. And it's the, the capillaries in the choroid plexus are more permeable than anywhere else in the brain. So a number of viruses go through them, they get into the CSF, and then they can spread uh, elsewhere in the CNS. So that's how viruses get into tissues, by these capillaries. And then once they're there, they, some of them replicate, but some of them don't. And whether they do or not is called the tropism, the tissue tropism of the virus. So we call viruses according to where they can replicate. Neurotropic, for example, means that they can replicate in nerve tissues. Hepatotropic or enterotropic. Uh, and in general, 
Some vi most viruses, in fact, have a limited tropism. There are very few that replicate in many tissues, which we call pantropic. And part of virology is aimed at trying to understand what controls tropism. Why, why doesn't a virus replicate in a particular tissue? Because if you can understand the mechanism, you might be able to design a therapy to prevent infection in other tissues, okay? So this is a big area of research in virology. And here are some of the determinants. So we have susceptibility if a, if a tissue has receptors or not. If there's no receptor, the virus is not going to replicate there. So that's a pretty easy one. Permissivity, uh, that is the post-receptor part of the replication cycle, the cell has to support that. And there are many cell proteins that viruses need to replicate. Some of these are transcription factors, for example, that are required for specific viruses. They may be present only in certain tissues. Uh, there are proteases as well. Accessibility is another determinant. The physical accessibility of a cell. Some cells just cannot be accessed by a virus and it will never infect them. Uh, and then host defenses uh, clearly control tropism. Not just physical defenses, but innate defenses at the site of infection. We know now that for many viruses, the innate, uh, the interferon system is actually an important determinant of tropism. Many peripheral organs are protected by it. For example, the tropism of polio is limited to the gut and the CNS. And the reason that all of our other organs are not infected, even though the virus is in the blood and can go to all of them, is because they're protected by the interferon system. But the brain is not, and I think that is because it would be bad to have an interferon uh, response in the brain. So here are some examples of how receptors control tropism. Uh, there are a number of receptor virus combinations where it's clear that tropism is, is controlled, or maybe not. So for example, um, the major group rhinoviruses uh, utilize a receptor which is ubiquitous. So clearly this receptor cannot uh, control tropism. So, same with influenza virus. Um, influenza virus receptor is sialic acid. It's ubiquitous. Polio receptor is rather ubiquitous. I just told you the interferon response controls polio virus and herpes simplex virus receptors are ubiquitous. There are just a few where receptors seem to be controlling uh, distribution. Another determinant, as I told you, are, is cellular proteins, and a great example of this is the protease that cleaves the HA of influenza virus. Um, so remember, HA is the viral glycoprotein in the particle. It has to be cleaved in order for the virus to be infectious. And this cleavage can happen in the cell, depending on what cell type is involved. Remember, last time I talked about how cleavage could occur during transport through the Golgi. But that depends on the, the protease being pres present. In the respiratory tract, the proteases are not present in the cells. They are secreted by specific cells called clara cells. And these proteases cleave the HA as the virus comes out of the cell. So if one of these influenza viruses gets into your blood, which could happen, it may, let's say it infects the liver. Uh, it will infect the liver because the HA of that particle is cleaved. But then the new influenza virus is produced in the liver would not be cleaved, their HAs would not be cleaved, so the infection would stop there. So that's why the tropism of flu doesn't include the liver, because it needs this protease. Because remember, this, the receptor for the virus is everywhere, it's sialic acid. And this is just to remind you that the flu <coughs> HA is a viral glycoprotein, and the cleavage has to occur right down here near the fusion peptide to liberate that fusion peptide so this protein can catalyze fusion as, as the virus enters the cell. So the protease, again, that does that, we believe, is specific to the respiratory tract. But there is an exception. Uh, some strains of influenza virus have what's called a, a highly basic amino acid sequence around the cleavage site. Okay? That basically lets the HA be cleaved by proteases that are in lots of different tissues. Those are called ubiquitously expressed proteases. They're called furins, uh, and they're in the Golgi. So these viruses are cleaved as they're moving out of the cell, and these proteases are in many different cells. So you have to have a specific kind of influenza virus to have that cleavage site. Uh, and um, those viruses, as you might expect, can infect many organs because the protease is present in, in many cells that can cleave those virus and keep an infectious cycle going. Now, one of the reasons why we're concerned about avian 
influenza viruses, in particular H5N1 types of influenza viruses, is that they have a basic sequence at the uh, HA cleavage site. Now, the first time people were infected with these viruses was in 1997. There was a little outbreak in Hong Kong. A lot of people died. They isolated these viruses from them, and they turned out to have the furin cleavable uh, site here in the HA. And these people had systemic symptoms, which would be consistent with the virus replicating everywhere. So this virus apparently can replicate outside the respiratory tract because, in part, of this basic sequence at the cleavage site in the HA. So it's an example of how you can control the tropism of this virus by changing that cleavage site. Now, in order to spread a virus in a population, you have to shed it. If you keep the virus to yourself, no one else will get it. And so viruses have evolved to be shed. Uh, and this uh, is usually required, as I said, unless it's for transmission in the blood or maybe a germline transmitted virus. Of course, we have all these defective retroviruses in us, and we transmit them to our offspring. That's, that's, uh, vertical, that's germline transmission, but those aren't, uh, they don't produce virus particles in us, so that's not a real problem. Uh, shedding can occur where the virus first comes in, in the respiratory tract. It can come from wherever the virus ends up in your body. Uh, and as I said, this, this has to happen to maintain the virus in the population. How many are needed, again, that goes back to the very beginning of this talk, depends on the virus. Some viruses can transmit with very few particles and others uh, transmit with, need, require a lot. For respiratory viruses, um, coughing and sneezing and speaking makes these wonderful aerosols, as you can see here. And these are, if you have a virus infection, these are full of viruses. Um, they can also, uh, they can go different distances. So very small particles that you make go long distances. These are called infectious droplet nuclei. So they have a range of five to 160 feet. So some of the droplets produced by speaking can travel long distances. Others are, have shorter range because they're big and they fall to the ground. And this really depends on, on the virus and the kind of cough or sneeze that it's inducing in you. And then you can have transmission by nasal secretions. You touch your nose or your eyes and you transmit it to someone else as well. Now I have to show you this wonderful sneezing mu movie, which is accompanied by music, wonderful area. It's only a minute and a half. So you see most of those were big droplets that you uh, expel, they fall close to you, but they're also making really fine droplets that go lo longer distances. So, I mean, when you sneeze, that's what you look like. It's just not, you're not captured in slow motion, but uh, it's pretty uh, amazing. Uh, so shedding it happens in other ways besides the respiratory tract. You can shed virus and feces if it's replicating in your gut, of course. This is a major way that viruses spread in countries without good sewer systems, and there are plenty of those, but it still happens in the US. You know, we spread noroviruses this way as well. Uh, blood, of course, will spread infection, vector bites, drug users, IV drug users, healthcare workers who stick themselves with needles and so forth. 
Urine can spread the, the hantaviruses, so you can inhale mouse urine. If you're camping this summer, there was, uh, this fall, there was an outbreak of hantavirus in Yosemite, and people were camping in these cabins where mice were living, and they would inhale the, the dried urine that has virus in it and get this terrible lung infection. Semen can have virus. That's how HIV and other viruses are transmitted. There's a virus of mice that's, that transmits through milk. It's mouse mammary tumor virus. And then, of course, through the skin. Uh, herpes viruses, pox viruses, papilloma viruses are transmitted. There's one very common infection of wrestlers, herpes gladiatorum. These guys wrestle, they have lesions and they wrestle each other, they spread the virus and they, they don't care. And they, they just want to wrestle. You know? <laughs> just want to wrestle. You can tell the coach, I can't wrestle, I have a, a lesion. It's not gonna, anyway, and that, this is an example. These are, so, I just put this in today, so this is not in your notes. These are some morbidity and mortality reports of people who got, uh, they were given the smallpox vaccine. So we only give this to the military right now as in, in preparation for bioterrorism. So not, the general population doesn't get smallpox vaccine anymore because the virus has been eradicated. But what happens is these military people, they get the <coughs> smallpox vaccine and then they have sex with someone and the, the vaccine makes a lesion that's dripping and then the, the person they're having sex with gets infected. In these two cases, uh, the individual gets infected and that virus can go to mucous membranes. So it can go into very uh, sensitive areas, if you will. And so these are two examples. There are lots of these because this is an infectious virus vaccine. So it's an example of how you know, the virus is shedding at the site of inoculation. So the smallpox vaccine remains restricted to the place where you are inoculated, but you are shedding virus. And uh, you know, they put a Band-Aid on it when you leave, but it gets ripped off. and. Uh, you st you're still shed virus after a while. So just two examples of uh, how you can spread virus. Um, as I said already, you, you have to spread from host to host in order to maintain an infection. There are two sort of general patterns of spread. There's one where it goes from the same species to another, like human to human. So most of our infections are, are spread this way, measles, influenza, rhinoviruses, HIV, uh, the neuros, they all go from human to human. And then there's another kind where you're getting uh, a vector biting a, a vertebrate and, and you go around in a cycle. So here you have a tick which is carrying a virus, uh, can transmit it to its offspring so you can have more infected ticks. The tick will bite a rodent, the rodent gets a viremia. It's then bitten by another tick who picks up the virus and spreads to another rodent. So we have some human uh, virus infections that are spread by vectors like this. But again, the majority of them are going to human to human. And we'll talk a little bit more about this later when we talk about uh, emerging infections. And then you've sh we've shed virus. So we've tracked the virus through the host. It's shedding now. And then we have to transmit it to someone else. That, as I said earlier, that doesn't always happen. Again, it depends on where the virus is being shed, how stable it is, how much virus you're producing. So in general, envelope viruses uh, aren't spread well except by respiratory aerosols or secretions or direct injection. Uh, the the non-envelope viruses are more stable, so you can ingest those. Uh, you can get them from contaminated materials. So a fomite <coughs> is, is an object that is contaminated with virus. So, you know, this, if this uh, lectern were contaminated uh, and someone came in and got, up, got the infection, that would be called a fomite. And envelope viruses typically will not last long periods of time on the, on the built environment. So uh, the, the viruses that are typically spread this way are envelopes, so the uh, non-envelope. So the, the structure of the virus, again, will play into how uh, it is transmitted. And for transmission, we have very specific terms to describe what's going on, iatrogenic, when a healthcare worker infects you, and this could be in a hospital or anywhere, there are many instances where healthcare workers uh, are in a drugstore and they give you a vaccine and they could transmit infection. Yes? Um, what's a fomite? Fomite is an object in the built environment, you know, uh, towels, furniture that's contaminated with, uh, with virus. So iatrogenic means you get infected by a healthcare worker, and we'll see later that how this uh, contributed to the spread of HIV initially in, in Africa. Nosocomial is when you get infected in the hospital, which is uh, a really good, you have a really good chance of happening. I forgot the percentage, but it's, in general, it's best to stay out of hospitals because 
a good percentage of the time you come home with something that you didn't have. <laughs> Vertical transmission is from parent to offspring. So this is typically from mother to child, say during birth, but it can also be from father to child. And then uh, horizontal transmission is everything else. And then of course we have germline where you transmit the genome integrated in your DNA. So proviral DNA passed from one animal to another. And as I said, many times we have retroviruses in us, but they're not infectious. So we pass them on, but they don't give rise to viruses. But there are animals that pass on proviruses and then they make viruses in the host uh, that gets it. Finally, let's talk about the seasonality of infections. And we know that both geography and seasonality can infect uh, infections, geography because you need a particular vector or maybe there's an animal reservoir of the virus that you need. And at one time, uh, the viral distribution in the world was quite restricted. This is why the, the early explorers could go into Central America and wipe out all the people who lived there. They brought a new virus that they had never seen before, measles or smallpox, because viruses couldn't spread as readily. We didn't have any travel, but then the uh, the Europeans decided to travel and they brought their viruses with them. So here's an example of um, how the vector can localize a virus infection. This is, I, I just want to tell you this because I love this name, chikungunya virus, great name. Uh, it's an enveloped flavivirus and it's spread by the mosquito Aedes aegypti. And when you get infected, you get a rash, you have joint pains. So just think about this. You can figure out the pathogenesis. The mosquito bites you, and then you get a rash over the rest of your body. Uh, so the, the, this virus, for many years, was located in, a, in Africa and parts of Asia. But in 2004, it began to spread. It spread to India, and eventually it made its way to Europe, and now is in Australia as well. And why is this? Well, it turns out that the new, these new spreads, the new spread of this virus is because a new mosquito is spreading it. And that mosquito is Aedes albopictus, which is shown here, the so-called Asian tiger mosquito. And the virus underwent one amino acid change in the E1 glycoprotein. And that allowed it to now infect albopictus, because previously it would only use Aedes aegypti. So this helped to expand the range, the geographical range of this virus. So here is Aedes albopictus in the US. Came into the southern US via the tire trade. Used tires, full of water on container ships, mosquitoes breeding in them. Brought in Aedes albopictus, wasn't here at some point before. You can see it spread quite a bit. This is 2007, this was 2000 up here. This is 2007, you can see it's almost the entire uh, eastern half of the US. It's in South America, Asia, of course. So um, we could have, we don't have um, chikungunya in the US, but we could at some point because the vector is here. Viruses also have seasonality. Influenza is highly seasonal. Here in the Northern Hemisphere, it is a winter disease. So here is the outbreaks, the number of cases of influenza would by month over uh, 1994 to 1999. You can see there's a peak every year from November, November to May every year. And in the Southern Hemisphere, when they have their winter, there's a peak there as well. And other viruses are seasonal. Here's rubella. Even polio was seasonal when it was around. Why is this? Uh, we don't really know. Uh, one factor is clearly low humidity and temperature. So <coughs> these are experiments done here in New York at Mount Sinai using a guinea pig model of influenza. You put the guinea pigs in two racks of cages. You infect the first rack and you put a fan behind it and you blow the air towards the second rack and then the animals in the second rack get the virus through the air. So it's aerosol transmission. So using that, they could vary the temperature and the relative humidity in the room and ask, do these matter? And it turns out that the best transmission, so here you have percent transmission on the y-axis. Here's 100% transmission, that means all the guinea pigs get infected. Happens at um, low relative humidity, and it's best at five degrees versus 20 degrees. All right, and as you increase the relative humidity, you get less and less transmission. There's a funny peak that has to do with the size of the droplets that are made, but you can see it's always better at five degrees, but eventually at high humidity. So, the idea is in the winter here in New York City, it's dry, 
right, low humidity, and it's cold. So maybe that's why flu spreads well uh, in, in climates such as ours. The problem is if you go to the tropics, it screws up the whole theory, okay, because in the tropics, they also have a flu season. This is um, flu in Nicaragua, where the temperature is in the high 20s Celsius, and it's always 100% humidity, yet they have peaks of flu, which are shown in two different years, in the black and the red. You can see peaks uh, in, in summer and in the, in the fall winter months. Of course, the temperature is always the same. It's hot. It's always humid. So why is there a season? So we don't know. So the, the bottom line is virus infections are seasonal, but we don't really understand uh, why they are so.